my sermon passage is Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 16. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all lowliness and meekness, with patience, forbearing one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is he who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And his gifts were that some should be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the cunning of men, by their craftiness and deceitful wiles. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every joint with which it is supplied, when each part is working properly, makes bodily growth and upbuilds itself in love. The word of the Lord. Thanks. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. <clears throat> I started out this week ready to try to lead a life worthy of the calling to which I've been called with lowliness and meekness and patience. I started out ready to forbear all my brothers and sisters in Christ in love. I was eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. I wanted to sing, Come by Yah, my Lord, come by here. Or, in Christ there is no East or West. Or, we are one in the Spirit. Yes, Lord, blessed be the tie that binds. Yes, Lord. It lasted until Thursday at 6.54 a.m. And then I was reminded, thank you, the Reverend Dr. Mark Davies. He posted this on his blog and on Facebook. The reason American Christianity does not stand against the actions of our current president is because American Christianity is not Christianity properly understood as the way of Jesus. It puts a warped view of American before Christianity. Christians who live in the United States must reject this. What we are seeing in Christianity in the United States is a battle over whether the way of Jesus will have any real practical influence in the life of its churches and in the life of persons who call themselves Christians. Christians and Christian churches who do not welcome the stranger, who do not seek justice for the poor and oppressed, who do not care for the hungry, the thirsty, the sick, the homeless, the imprisoned, and all creation, are living in such a way as if the life and teachings of Jesus are wholly irrelevant. They have put nationalism, and in many cases, race, before the way of Jesus. They have put fear and hatred and their own desire for security before Jesus' call to seek justice for all people, to love all of our neighbors, and to be not afraid. They have exiled Jesus from their churches. Churches that would make Jesus weep that his name is being associated with the very expressions of hatred, fear, and corrupt power that Jesus gave his life to resist. The news that such Christians and such churches bring to the world is not the good news for the poor and oppressed that was the clarion call of Jesus' work in this world. Rather, 
It is news of exclusion, control, fear, and oppression of the weak and vulnerable in our midst. It is the news of exploitation of the community of all creation rather than its care. The religious freedom that such Christians and churches seek is a freedom to discriminate and exclude rather than a responsible freedom that seeks love and justice for all. Jesus would set foot in such churches for only one thing, to turn over the tables of injustice and to call us all to repentance, to turn away from fear, hate, and nationalism so that we might turn our lives toward the good news of the beloved community. The response that such Christians and churches would make to Jesus' message would likely be similar to the violent rejection Jesus received at the hands of the corrupt power of the empire of his day. And with so many people in our churches carrying guns, a brown man turning over tables and calling out for repentance might not even make it out of church alive. End quote. Well, there went my mood. <laughs> I do see why Dr. Davies keeps getting asked back to preach here when I take a Sunday off. But what a drag. And what a drag we live in, because I'm thinking, maintain unity, unity, unity. Unity of the spirit, spirit, spirit. And the bond of peace, peace, peace. And I say it every week. Love one another. And y'all say, gracefully, every single other. And then there's Ephesians and the Ephesian Christians who are in similar circumstances to our own, caught in a great divide and divides among different kinds of Christians. There's one body and one spirit, it says, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. On page 43 of the African American Heritage Hymnal is that responsive reading for reconciliation. And a few pages later on page 49 is another one for unity. Unity! That's crazy talk, isn't it? How many Christian denominations are there? Well, not as many as people keep saying. There really aren't 30,000. That's a number that's been, <laughs> there's a number that's been thrown, floating around out there for 30 years. It's not really that many, but there's enough. Baptists alone, my fellow former uh, Baptist sisters and brothers, <laughs> Baptists alone used to be called the Baskin Robbins of Christianity <laughs> because Baskin Robbins has 31 flavors of ice cream and there are at least 31 flavors of Baptists. <laughs> so unity, now especially, with churches torn over this accidental president like they have not been torn since the Civil Rights Movement. There are weeds mixed in with the wheat, and there are goats running loose among the sheep. Unity? Not likely. No more than Christian abolitionists and Christian slaveholders. No more than the Confessing Church and the Protestant Reich Church in Germany, in Nazi Germany. No more than the Dutch Reformed Mission Church versus apartheid in South Africa. Unity? No more than that. But listen, no less than that either. The cold truth is that Christians held slaves and Christians freed slaves. Christians supported Hitler and Christians opposed Hitler. And Christians supported apartheid and Christians opposed it. Each side will answer. And Christians, millions of them, voted to make things the way they are today. And they will do so again, leaving the rest of us dumbfounded over what seems to us to be willful blindness. It's not blindness to Donald Trump's personal sin, because we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But blindness to the meanness and the baseness of his immoral public policies and congressional leaderships. And this is all on top of the things that were keeping the, the denominations and Christians uh, separate and different in the first place. I mean, we disagree over what it means to say the Bible has authority. We disagree over ideas of Christian purpose in the world. Why are we here? What are we saved for? And we disagree over what it means to pray God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We Christians are all over the maps on all of this. 
So unity with humility and meekness even, in the face of all those differences, yes, unity in Christ. If in Christ they be, if in Christ we be, and we are in fact called to love them. But thanks be to God, unity is not uniformity. And we are not in fact called to like them or to keep quiet. We, we are not to be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by their cunning, craftiness, and deceit, but neither are we to toss others around with our own wind, with our own cunning and craftiness and deceit. We don't answer tricks with tricks. Rather, Ephesians says we're to speak the truth with love. Speak the truth with love. That's been, mis been, been, that's been misused like everything else it seems like. Speak the truth in love does not mean to speak our pet biases with false piety, like love the sinner, hate the sin. Or it would be a sin for me to bake you a gay wedding cake. Do you know how close that is to love the sinner, hate the skin? Or it would be a sin for me to bake you an African-American wedding cake? Think about it. I guarantee that Attorney General Jeffrey Beauregard Sessions has thought about it. Last Monday, pretending to speak the truth, the AG spoke bias dressed up in Christian piety, in conservative white American Christian piety, with four words that should put the fear of man into all of us. Federal Religious Liberty Task Force. Religious Liberty Task Force within the Department of Justice. He said, he said, let's be frank, a dangerous movement undetected by many but real is now challenging and eroding our great tradition of religious freedom. There can be no doubt, it's no little matter. It must be confronted intellectually and politically and defeated. This election, this past election, and much that has followed from it gives us a rare opportunity to arrest these trends and to confront them. That is red meat for red America. But let's be frank. White conservative Christians' feelings are hurt, but they're not being discriminated against. And now, they're being elevated to a new level of privilege being written into Justice Department guidelines. It's also under the cover of religious freedom they can perpetuate actual discrimination against women, religious minorities, racial minorities, LGBTQ plus people, pretty much anybody that makes them uncomfortable. Wedding cakes are just wedding cakes. Why not marriage itself? Why not same-sex marriage? Why not interracial marriage? Why not home sweet home itself? Why fair housing? What if I don't want to rent to a gay couple or a black couple or a mixed couple or to a liberal white couple, for that matter, if it goes against my religious freedom? That stuff's being written into the guidelines used by the Justice Department. Tell me it can't happen again. Mary C. Curtis, a columnist for the newspaper Roll Call, was reminded of Mildred, an African-American woman, and Richard Loving, a white man found guilty in 1959 of cohabitating as man and wife against the peace and dignity of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Of Virginia. The judge declared, the judge declared, Almighty God created the races, white, black, yellow, Malay, and red, and he placed them on separate continents. The fact that he separated the races shows that he did not intend for the races to mix from the mouth of the judge in the state court in Virginia. It was eventually overturned. But that was in 1959, one year before Trinity blazed the trail of integrated worship in Oklahoma City. That's the America that the President of the United States and his supporters want to make great again. And so much of the alleged church is lending its support. We are all in this thing together, but unity in Christ is not uniformity. And in fact, it is our unity in Christ that demands that we speak out and call out this sin for their sake and for our own sake in the name of Jesus and justice. 
We must all grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, it says, because when the whole body, which when each part is working properly, makes bodily growth and that builds itself in love. The church has organ failure. That's why the Reverend Dr. William Barber, leader of the new Poor People's Campaign, keeps calling for and calling up a force of the moral defibrillators of our time. <laughs> what a way with words that brother has. We must shock this nation with the power of love, he says. We must shock this nation with the power of mercy, he says. We can't give up on the heart of our democracy, not now, not ever, he says. And the country has a hardened heart, partly because the church's heart is failing. The country will probably survive, although we may not recognize it. The church may survive, and we, might, we may not recognize it either. If so, people will know it, not because of church buildings or stupid politics or Jeff Sessions' Federal Religious Liberty Task Force. People will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yeah, they'll know we are Christians by our love. In the meantime, with our brothers and sisters following ways other than Jesus, we must not seek conflict nor avoid it for their sake for our sake and for the wider church's sake and with all our brothers and sisters we must love selflessly not egotistically or self-righteously but and speak truth to them for their sake for our sake and for the wider church's sake lest we forget though we all have fallen short of the glory of god let us pray Oh, God, thank you for old prayers through which the cloud of witnesses can guide us. When we're so alarmed and weary, we don't know for sure what to pray. Such as this, adapted from the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer. God, grant us grace fearlessly to contend against evil and to make no peace with oppression within your church or without. And so we may reverently use our freedom, help us to employ it in the maintenance of justice in our communities, our churches, and the nation. And Lord, may we pray this and seek it and work for it, whether others in your fold do or not. A prayer for unity, not uniformity. God grant that your church, being bound together in love and obedience to you, may be united in one body by the one spirit, that the world may believe in him whom you have sent, your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.